project. Uh, I have the pleasure of welcoming you to um, one of Open Entrance uh, workshops, scenarios for low carbon futures of the European energy system. And uh, in my mind, this is um, really one of the important issues for Europe uh, at the moment and in the coming uh, years. Uh, we want to discuss or share uh, kind of what we've been thinking about with you uh, related to how to realize the Green Deal policy and uh, how to reach the, our 2050 targets. So, um, and, and the discussion we want to, we hope can take place is between the modelers uh, how to kind of uh, create the best pathways to this target and um, uh, with the policy makers uh, so that uh, the policy makers actually can ask the researchers, modelers, the good questions about kind of how to get there and that we can have an ongoing discussion in the year to come on kind of how to find the best, best uh, pathway to, to the future we want to create. So, um, so that, that'll be my, um, my uh, kind of uh, uh, welcome to you. Uh, as you see, the objective of the workshop is quite more concrete than, than what I said uh, initially. Uh, there has been uh, constructed uh, four scenarios uh, and pathways. Um, uh, kind of to to kind of make more uh, also to describe in a more realistic and concrete manner how the 1.5 uh, degree scenario can be reached uh, and also one 2.0 scenario uh, it might be realistic uh, or not and we try to kind of uh, stretch the the axis a little bit how can it done, be done by means of technology? Uh, how can the society itself do it? Uh, how can you could say very directed policies make it happen? And probably the, uh, the solution lies somewhere in a combination of them, but how to combine them uh, is an open question and something that we as modelers would like to kind of show to the policymakers and, and have a good discussion about. So we want feedback on the energy transition pathways we will be showing you. Uh, we want the discussion uh, about uh, what does this tell us, what's uh, right, what's wrong with them, how can they be adjusted and, and, and see kind of what other um, effects these uh, scenarios might have that is not embedded in the modeling. Um, and of course, part of the idea of uh, open entrance is that it's open. Uh, so we're putting it on this on the table, uh, the analysis, some of the analysis tools, the data, so that others can kind of use their tools in order to to, to quality assure or to have alternative views on the scenarios. Uh, I'll stop there and then give the word to Pedro uh, Crespo del Granado, who has been really instrumental in putting this program together. Pedro. Thank, thank you, Peter. Uh, yes, uh, so we have uh, developed a really nice program for today. Uh, where um, we're going to have divided in two parts. Uh, the first part we're going to discuss, uh, as Peter has mentioned, about some presentations on decarbonization pathways, um, the open entrance, uh, latest results uh, on our decarbonization pathways and this 3D concept of defining them. Um, this will be with a panel discussion uh, that uh, we will uh, together uh, have a constructive discussion about how this relates to the EU Green Deal and other challenges and opportunities in decarbonizing, decarbonizing, decarbonizing the energy system. Uh, 
then we will have a break, which we is going to be very interactive break, very um, uh, where we will have some uh, virtual tables and virtual chat for those who want to have uh, more spontaneous discussions as we would have if this would not be uh, digital. And the second part is where we will focus on two really good uh, macroeconomic models that are being used for European wide assessment of policies. One from uh, Open Entrance, uh, NTNU, and one from E3 modeling, and that focus on uh, uh, macroeconomic perspective. Follow our discussion, and again at the end, we will have an open coffee virtual coffee where we will have the option to go and have some chats with the speakers or, and other people uh, that you might want to have a spontaneous discussion. Um, I think as, uh, as uh, you can also be active on the chat, you can also uh, please uh, write anything uh, constructive or feedback that you want to ask uh, on, the, on the chat we will collect these questions and we will raise these questions either on the panel or at the end of our presentation. Uh, so please use the chat um, and, uh, and, uh, and thanks for, for coming. So now we start with the, uh, with the Open Entrance Project at Glance. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. you. Yeah, fine. Uh, my name is uh, Ingeborg Grobak. I'm from Sint of Energy Research. I'm the coordinator of Open Entrance. Uh, and I will uh, present for you uh, or give you an overall presentation of, of Open Entrance and focus more about uh, other aspects of the project and those you are going to dig into later today. Open Entrance uh, is the abbreviation for Open energy transition and voices for a low carbon economy and uh, the aim uh, for open entrance is on the next slide with if you go further please thank you the aim is to develop apply and disseminate an open and integrated modeling platform designed to assess low carbon transition pathways in europe and on the next slide, you see the um, you see a, a figure uh, with the open platform, because the open platform uh, uh, contains, among other, uh, or includes, among other, a suite of modeling tools. Uh, the, those tools are fully open with description, code, input data, and output data. So it's possible for anyone to run the models and build and, de uh, and develop them further. Uh, the models are linked, uh, are soft linked in the way that output from one model is input to another. And one of the uh, models you're going to hear more about later today is the Genesis mod, the energy system model, which we have used for developing the common energy scenarios per European country. Those scenarios are also fully open. All input and output data uh, on country level for Europe towards 2050. Uh, we um, discuss this platform and also the analysis we do with this platform with what we call decision and policy makers. And this workshop today is a part of those discussions. So on the next slide, I go, um, uh, you can see more about the open platform. As I said, it's uh, a suite of open modeling tools, the energy system model. Uh, Pedro men mentioned uh, one of our macroeconomic models, the REMES model, and we also have uh, the export model from TNO. So we, are, we have two macroeconomic models as a part of this platform. We have uh, several investment models, for example, uh, the Empire model and the TEPAS models, which you can use for uh, analyzing investments in transmission capacity and production capacity. 
There's also a modeling suite for the electricity system, uh, the plan for EU uh, suite developed in the plan for S uh, project. And this uh, includes also a capacity a capacity expansion model, but it's also a seasonal storage valuation tool, and for, uh, finally a European operational dispatch model. We also have local models, so the models go from a pan-European level to a country level and to the single consumer level. For the single consumer, it's possible uh, to analyze uh, optimal charge and discharge of a local storage battery. These models are linked via data format and a nomenclature which is developed in the project. This is also fully open available for anyone who wants to use it further and uh, to, for those who want to add, um, add more, uh, uh, include more into the nomenclature than we have done so far. The open platform includes a scenario explorer, which is a database with all these European scenario data. It will also uh, later include results from nine case studies we are going to do, and also from the macroeconomic analysis. And later, it will also be possible for third parties to link their own models to this database. And uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, Open Entrance is a consortium of 14 partners. You can see the map to, to the left and a list of the partners to the right. We started this project in May 2019 and will go on to uh, April 2023. So we have two, a little bit more than two more years to work with this uh, platform. And on the next slide, you can see our web page. Uh, so, uh, so we hope you will go into this web page and read more about the project and follow us because we will uh, disseminate more information here when uh, uh, we achieve new milestones. You can also subscribe for our uh, newsletter and we also hope that you will follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. On the, my last slide, I'm saying a little bit about um, openness in energy system modeling, because why is this so important? It's very cost efficient uh, because uh, researchers can build on what other researchers has, have done. Uh, for example, data gathering often take a lot of time in energy system modeling, but uh, with uh, projects like Open Entrance, uh, you can uh, use what others have developed before. It improves the quality because people outside the consortium, consortium can uh, assess what we have done uh, and give us feedback and that improves the quality. It also increases the understanding of the results since everything is open, every input data is open and it's possible to, it's easier to understand what impact the results. And it also increases trust because you better understand what is behind the results. So trust is important, I think, for the further development of Europe towards a low carbon economy. And then Open Entrance is developing this very strong open platform. Uh, and I think this um, openness gives another strength to the analysis, a kind of muscles to the analysis, uh, which is very important important. So to other researchers, I would say, use this platform and give us feedback, suggest improvements. We will work, as I said, with it two more years and your feedback will be very much welcomed. And also add your own resource to our platform and do comparative studies to what we have done. And to the commission, I will encourage you to require openness in further energy modeling project because you have the strength to do this and to as I say, add, the add new muscles to energy system modeling. So with these words, I would say I will wish you a hopefully a useful day, good discussions, and also pleasant conversations in the breaks. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ingeborg. And uh, I'd like to kind of repeat the last uh, challenge by Ingeborg that uh, this uh, is a platform that really is open. Also, the catch is that you have to kind of uh, adhere to a certain format in the, in the data. Um, 
when you describe the input and the output, but if you do that, uh, you put uh, your your analysis and your results uh, open for everybody to 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 share and to look at and to compare with. So so that's the um, that's the challenge to remember. Uh, we are quite on time, I think. Uh, and I won't spend too much time in introducing the next speaker. I think he's a well-known person within the modeling community. Uh, we are now, we'll have three presentations. Uh, we will switch quite quickly between them. Um, and starting, uh, as I said, uh, describing the scenarios is uh, Professor Dr. Hans Auer from uh, TU in Vienna. Please. Hans. Okay, thank you. I told so I try to share my screen now. Yeah. Okay. So I hope it uh, it works. It looks good if you yeah. are able to make it uh, in show mode and uh, it will fill yeah, the whole just, screen, I think. Just a moment, so now it should perfectly. Work. Please go ahead, fine. Yeah. Okay, so thanks uh, for your kind introduction, uh, Petar. Uh, so uh, my name is Hans uh, Auer, uh, and I'm since uh, more than 25 years with uh, Technische Universität Wien, uh, or Vienna University of Technology, and we are doing a lot of uh, energy system analysis uh, and modeling in this uh, context. Uh, so uh, now in the next 20 minutes, uh, so I will uh, present uh, the major highlights uh, uh, of our pan-European uh, results uh, on aggregated uh, level uh, of our uh, low carbon uh, scenarios. So uh, I think it's very important at the beginning uh, that we have a common understanding uh, uh, about these uh, scenarios. So, so how to, to, to understand them. Uh, so they are based uh, on the storyline uh, approach we developed, this uh, three-dimensional uh, uh, approach. I will talk a little bit later uh, on this. Uh, uh, and uh, today I present, uh, let's say, the quantitative uh, numbers uh, based on our modeling uh, exercise. So uh, both uh, reports uh, can be found on the Open Entrance uh, website where there are uh, details uh, uh, about uh, both of these, the, the storylines and uh, what I present now in the next 20 minutes. Uh, so with our uh, analysis, so uh, we comply to the 1.5 uh, uh, or uh, in one a, a little bit more conservative uh, scenario uh, to the two degree uh, global warming uh, targets. So, so therefore, of course, uh, we uh, uh, needed a number on the remaining uh, CO2 budget and this uh, has been fixed by the uh, IAM uh, model uh, message uh, Globium. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, to achieve carbon neutra neutrality in 2040 or 2050, in a little bit more conservative uh, uh, scenario, so we have uh, determining uh, parameters. So we have uh, technologies, the availability or the uh, anticipation uh, when uh, novel technologies, new technologies are available. And then, of course, our model determines also what uh, the technology exchange rates uh, need to be. And uh, one of the triggering parameters is, uh, is the CO2 price, finally, of course, uh, linked uh, to the remaining CO2 budget. And uh, our results, so, so they are really ambitious, what I present uh, right now, and uh, maybe uh, in real life, so, so we cannot imagine that uh, this, this will happen or this can happen, but uh, these scenarios, they show the necessity uh, not only of the optimization model to find feasible solutions, so, so purely the analytical approach needs these, uh, these results, uh, but uh, they also show us uh, what is needed if we seriously intend to comply to these 1.5 or 2 degree targets. Uh, and as I said, so, so we must, uh, uh, let's say, uh, reconsider our thinking, uh, what's supposed to be uh, possible, what's uh, to, supposed to be feasible, uh, and also uh, financial. Uh, so, so in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, technology uh, uh, exchange rates uh, in energy uh, transition. And therefore, for instance, uh, we have not used, intentionally not used the business as usual terminology anymore. So our most uh, conservative uh, uh, storyline and then scenario, the gradual development is uh, even more what uh, 
what's supposed to be uh, business as usual uh, in the past. And as already uh, mentioned uh, before, so, so we develop uh, here an open source uh, model and a tool and then a platform. Uh, and uh, for instance, uh, this model, Genesis Mod, uh, uh, which uh, delivered these results uh, today. So this uh, can be seen as some kind of piano. Uh, it's fully open then uh, for everybody uh, and everybody in the future can play on it uh, and carry out uh, own analysis. Uh, so, so this is uh, very important uh, to have this in mind. Uh, so here uh, we see the, uh, or Petr already has shown in the introduction, the, the storyline approach. So we opened uh, three dimensions. So, so three driving forces, how our uh, energy future could look like uh, in Europe in the future. So on the one hand, we have technology. On the other hand, society. Uh, and the third dimension is, is policy. So uh, the technology dimension more or less shows us, so, uh, whether or not we have uh, novelty, we have breakthrough of new technologies like CCS or other technologies or uh, commercial hydrogen production. And then in terms of society, the question is, is there an uh, awareness an attitude? Uh, so from the bottom up, so from uh, the individuals uh, uh, or not, uh, or do they need more, let's say incentives on the other hand uh, from the policy. And just an example, how we developed uh, uh, these storylines, it's always the combination of two of these drivers. So if we, uh, in front of us, if we have a look at the techno-friendly storyline, so this means that on the one hand, we have uh, 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 novel technologies, a breakthrough of CCS technologies, offshore floating wind turbines, uh, large-scale hydrogen production, and so on. And on the other hand, uh, society is also willing to, to accept and uh, adapt uh, also these uh, using the benefits of the economies of scale, of uh, large scale uh, 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 production of these uh, sustainable technologies. And uh, finally here, for instance, the market delivers. So there is not a, a big or a significant need for the policies to, to provide incentives, uh, to, to incentivize, uh, to, to provide uh, subsidies and so on. Uh, on the other hand, so for instance, the directed uh, transition uh, here, the market not necessarily delivers, you need more policy steering. And uh, on the other hand, so the, the blue one, uh, the, the societal commitment uh, shows that on the one hand, uh, society is willing to adapt, but uh, we must rely rather on the technologies we have right now and there is no significant uh, breakthrough and uh, therefore, of course, policies need to uh, implement also incentives uh, that society uh, uh, adapts and implements very fast. Uh, and these uh, three storylines, they comply to the 1.5 degree uh, scenario and the gradual development. Uh, so, so in the middle is, uh, is a little bit more conservative. So this is a little uh, bit of each of them uh, and this complies to the two degree scenario. So, so this is uh, the, the, the storyline approach we used and uh, based uh, on them, we show uh, then quantitative numbers. So I show here the flow chart of our modeling approach. I do not go into details. So, so this is uh, not uh, the aim now of this presentation. Uh, it shall uh, just uh, show that on the one hand, we had uh, a status quo of the Genesis uh, mod model. So it was uh, initially further developed uh, from the osmosis uh, project. So we had a status quo and we adapted uh, it to our research uh, questions and modeling uh, needs uh, here in open entrance. The input scaling, of course, took into account uh, to be also consistent and coherent with other studies, uh, already existing work, so uh, 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 known uh, modeling uh, or known European models, uh, exercises, uh, and also the World Energy Outlook. Uh, so so to, to, to have some kind of uh, comparability then uh, also of our results. And we also, uh, made some kind of validation with our uh, uh, model genesis mod with other models like uh, message ix and we took the most alike existing pathways and and, and compared it so so this uh, can details can be uh, let's say started in the deliverable 3.1 uh, you can download uh, from the project web website I, I do not want to go further into the details uh, because here it's also shown then uh, how country specific uh, results in detail will be uh, delivered uh, later on uh, in the project and, and how the link to the open uh, platform uh, will be uh, and so on. So as I said, so, so the, the, the tool, the piano, 
uh, being uh, available for the community than fully open uh, is Genesis mod. On the left hand side, we see uh, the initial uh, granularity uh, on geographic level, and, and on the right hand side, we see the status quo right now. Based on uh, this uh, granularity, uh, we delivered now, uh, let's say, the result. Uh, results, but I only present, uh, let's say, the aggregated uh, pan-European results. Uh, as I said, the country-specific ones, they will be uh, delivered in one year or so. Uh, so, so we uh, made, of course, many or our colleagues from Theo Berlin. So it's uh, uh, developed by uh, Theo Berlin. Uh, Carlo will also be uh, one of the presenters uh, later on. There have been made, uh, of course, many uh, uh, improvements uh, uh, and uh, adaptions in terms of functionalities uh, and uh, improvements also in terms of uh, granularity. Uh, here we see uh, just a small uh, list. So initially there have been time slices. Now it's replaced uh, by uh, hourly resolution and time clustering uh, algorithm and so on. Uh, and uh, many uh, further uh, disaggregation, so in terms uh, of data in the different sectors uh, have been conducted and it's uh, very important to no note that it's uh, still uh, ongoing work, of course. Uh, so uh, notably in terms of uh, country uh, specific input data set settings. And also the functionality was extended, not only uh, being able to model a CO2 budget, but uh, also uh, uh, a carbon uh, price uh, mechanism. And we used, so for instance, for the direct transition, uh, so, so this is the uh, most policy steering uh, uh, scenario. We, we, we used uh, still the, uh, the CO2 uh, budget approach that we have uh, a remaining CO2 budget and finally, uh, the shadow price of, of the model in the optimization exercise uh, shows us what's the expected uh, the CO2 price we need finally to trigger the uh, technology uh, switch uh, uh, or exchange uh, rates. And now I already come to, to a few highlights of uh, our uh, results. So as I said, we have uh, four uh, different, uh, uh, let's say, clusters uh, uh, of uh, quantitative uh, uh, scenario results. I, I, I will go through a little bit more in detail uh, the societal uh, commitment uh, uh, and uh, present for the remaining three, uh, let, let's say a little bit more uh, the, the, the unique properties uh, than of the remaining uh, ones. So uh, here we see on the left hand side that of course uh, we have to significantly uh, uh, reduce uh, primary uh, energy use until uh, uh, 2050. So uh, it has to be uh, reduced to uh, around 50%. And of course, that we have to decarbonize uh, significantly. Uh, and uh, on the left hand side, uh, we see that we have to uh, phase out from uh, all the, the, the fossils. Uh, the red one is, uh, is gas. And we see that we uh, use in 2040 uh, still a little bit of gas, but uh, finally, uh, uh, that's it more or less. And uh, the, the, the future, let's say, uh, primary uh, fuels are uh, solar, wind, and of course a few uh, others. Uh, this is what we see here. And on the right-hand side, we see the corresponding uh, development of the emissions in the different sectors. Uh, and as I already uh, said, if we want to comply to the 1.5 degree uh, scenario, this more or less means uh, that we need uh, net zero uh, emissions more or less already in 2040. So, so, so this is in uh, 19, 20 years from, uh, from now on in order to comply uh, to, to our goals. And then uh, uh, here uh, we see from uh, the societal commitment scenario, uh, the electricity generation technologies, the further development. So electricity uh, generation will more or less uh, double uh, compared uh, to the status quo uh, right now. And of course, increasingly, uh, the, the fractions of uh, wind onshore, offshore uh, will increase and in societal commitment, of course, also solar PV significantly. And here solar PV shows both ut utility scale, but also uh, local self-consumption, so in energy communities, uh, for instance. And uh, of course, we are proving uh, continuously our, uh, not only the model, but also result presentation. And in the final version, we also will uh, show here, for instance, in the yellow color, the the, the, the solar PV generation split into utility scale and, uh, uh, and uh, self uh, generation. Uh, so in energy communities and uh, for prosumers. And then we have, of course, on country level, uh, uh, 
the, the, the different fractions of electricity generation. And this societal commitment uh, scenario, this uh, also shows uh, a possible future world. Uh, so, so it's not a prediction. So this is very important to correctly understand storylines. So, so we do not uh, say uh, this uh, storyline uh, and the corresponding scenario uh, uh, is uh, or will come more uh, probable than another one but in this storyline so, so we have set the constraints uh, to the model that we completely phase out from nuclear but this is the only one so so, so this is a model setting that uh, we expect from the model in 2050 uh, to phase out but of course the remaining ones they they, they still have uh, nuclear we also uh, uh, continuously take into account uh, uh, the ongoing policies, uh, for instance, France now officially has announced that uh, there will be a lifetime extension of nuclear power plants for another 10 years. Uh, and uh, this is what we already anticipated, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a few months ago when we delivered and calculated these results in the remaining ones, uh, this is uh, already implemented. And then uh, here and, uh, I show the, the, the results in the different sectors, on the left-hand side, the residential sector and the industry sector. We see uh, that we here also significantly phase uh, out from uh, fr from gas until uh, 2040, 2045, and in the residential sector we uh, will increasingly uh, see an electrification of the system uh, and also in the industry, uh, the residential sector. So, for instance, heat uh, pumps uh, will be uh, dominated, uh, but also others, also geothermal uh, energy and so on. Uh, and finally, we also uh, consider the transport sector. On the one hand, on the left-hand side here, we see passenger transport, uh, and on the right-hand side, uh, freight transport. Uh, in, in, the, in the passenger transport uh, sector, of course, we need a lot of uh, uh, e-mobility, electric uh, vehicles uh, uh, on the road, uh, and uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the freight uh, sec uh, transport sector, of course, uh, also our model, uh, uh, relies on hydrogen in order to need, uh, uh, in order to meet, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the, 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 the settings to comply, settings to comply with the 1.5 degree scenario. Okay, so, so this was now the first uh, cluster. So, so this was a, a comprehensive presentation of the results, and now I only show for the remaining ones a few highlights and the, the differences uh, or the most important differences. So the techno-friendly. Uh, here uh, I show uh, the electricity generation on uh, the left hand side and in the techno friendly as I already said in the storyline uh, uh, explanation so here we'll, we rely on uh, uh, on the economies of scale of uh, let, let's say the uh, big uh, 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 offshore wind uh, farms uh, uh, and technologies uh, de delivering uh, on, on large scale. Uh, and then this is, uh, let's say, one of the, the main characteristics here on the left-hand side, uh, if we uh, uh, compare, let's say, the, uh, the, the, the dark or, or the, the blue-gray, so it's more gray uh, than, than blue colors, so, so it's equal. Uh, and this is, uh, let's say, equal share of onshore and offshore in 2050. And our offshore uh, uh, numbers, uh, in 2050 here show more or less uh, 1,700 terawatt hours uh, uh, of electricity generation uh, based on offshore wind. So, so this is more than twice uh, what has been, uh, let, let's say, assumed in, in, in the uh, recent World Energy Outlook where there also was a focus on, uh, on offshore wind. But, but uh, this scenario here uh, is even more, more ambitious. And in the techno-friendly, so here we also rely on the breakthrough uh, of uh, novel technologies like CCS. So we have the we, we see on the right hand side the CO2 emissions, but uh, even more important here on the left hand side. So so here we uh, also uh, see a negative uh, let's say CO2 uh, emissions. So so CO2 removal technologies, uh, and therefore on the right hand side in the industry. So so there uh, is not a need uh, to let's say to phase out from uh, from the fossils uh, as fast as for instance in the societal commitment because we can let's say absorb uh, some co2 emissions in the, the ccs uh, technology so so this uh, is uh, uh, one of the examples uh, how an alternative energy future uh, could happen without uh, let's say guessing uh, which uh, let's say story and scenario finally will become true in real life and uh, here we see directed uh, transition. Directed transition, as I 
uh, already said, has a strong policy focus. So, so where uh, policies uh, trigger and uh, uh, and govern uh, also future uh, developments. So on, on the left hand side, so for instance, you see again the primary uh, energy uh, fuels, the development. So. So in dark red, so for instance, you see here also nuclear. So we anticipated uh, here in the model, uh, so, so the ongoing discussions or maybe the one or uh, another country will also uh, discuss is to phase in into nuclear. Uh, and we uh, anticipated uh, this uh, in addition, of course, to uh, existing implemented policies uh, of lifetime extensions and, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, and on the right hand side you see, uh, let's say, the electricity uh, fraction of this uh, uh, only. And of course, so this is a, a model, uh, let's say, making a snapshot uh, on a five years average. And for instance, here, so, so if we uh, focus, have a focus on nuclear, so between uh, 2020 and 25, so, so we have more nuclear uh, ca capacities. Somebody, of course, also could uh, uh, model uh, them uh, in uh, 2030, let's say, only. Uh, anticipating so, so, so that uh, then the nuclear power plant finally uh, is, is, is online uh, technology current, currently under, under construction. Uh, but, but finally, this does not uh, change, let's say, the, 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 the results of the model. Uh, the earlier, let's say, uh, and already, let's say, uh, under construction or uh, developed technology um, uh, is used, let's say, the more we can release uh, in the later years, because otherwise our model, so between uh, 45 and 50, uh, simply uh, needs to produce, let, let's say, hydrogen uh, uh, or uh, another technology to finally comply uh, to, to, our, to our results. So, so but this uh, will be, uh, of course, uh, uh, fine-tuned uh, also now in the country-specific uh, settings. Uh, and uh, of course, when we uh, deliver the final uh, results in towards the end of the year or beginning uh, next year, of course, we uh, perfectly scale everything to the up-to-date uh, policies uh, right now. And uh, uh, as I already said, so in the directed transition, uh, we, uh, on the one hand, uh, still have, let's say, uh, significant nuclear capacities uh, in, in the countries, uh, uh, where the policies uh, also point in, in, into that direction. And uh, on the other hand, for instance, also in Poland, we see that the, the, the coal dominated electricity system is, uh, for instance, increasingly uh, replaced uh, by gas uh, fire power plants. And the gradual development, as I already said, is a little bit of each. So here we have uh, less uh, uh, final demand reductions. Therefore, we need more primary uh, energy use and electricity generation. Uh, and uh, uh, most important is what we see on the right hand side that we do not uh, need to to approach carbon uh, neutrality in 2040 but in 2050 we see here in 2040 we still have a significant uh, co2 emissions and we also do not rely here on uh, uh, co2 removal technologies uh, and uh, this is supposed to be the, a scenario complying uh, to the two degree uh, uh, global warming uh, target and then uh, in, in the corresponding report of these scenarios in 3.1, we have uh, nice uh, comparisons uh, of the different uh, uh, scenarios uh, in terms of uh, different indicators. So here on the left hand side, we see the capacities uh, of the installed uh, electricity uh, generations and on the right hand side, uh, the, the, the hydrogen use. I will uh, just, uh, let's say, mention two or three features each. each. So, uh, electricity generation capacities. So the, the yellow, uh, the, the yellow color shows the techno friendly. So this means uh, that we rely on the economies of scale uh, and we need less uh, installed capacities. Uh, on the other hand, uh, so for, uh, for, for instance, the, uh, the, the, the blue one is the societal uh, commitment. So these are the small rooftop PVs and so on. There have, we have high decentralized and, and local installed uh, capacities. So, so for instance, so, so this is how these uh, figures can be interpreted. And on the other hand, uh, on the right hand side, uh, so for instance, when talking about the uh, hydrogen, uh, so, so, we, uh, so, so when uh, looking to the 
to, to, to the red color. So this is the gradual development. So uh, there is not necessarily a significant penetration until 2040. But then let, let's say that the needs of our model until 2050 is that in the last 10 years, we produce a lot of hydrogen in order to comply uh, to the two degree scenario. So, so this is a necessity of our model. And of course, it's also, it's also risky if we right now say, OK, we will not uh, progress with hydrogen until 2040, but we rely on the period between 2040 and 2050. And uh, this is, uh, let's say, one uh, key figure <laughs> and the key result also of our uh, exercise, because these are the CO2 prices or the carbon prices uh, finally governing uh, all the, let's say, uh, trade-offs uh, in, in the model, the economic trade-offs. And uh, this is not, uh, let's say, what we wish <laughs> Uh, carbon prices should be, so, so these are endogenous <laughs> results of the model to find feasible uh, solutions. And uh, if we uh, have a look at the, the, the green uh, color, so this is the directed transition, so this is the, let's say, the least, the least risky one, that we say, okay, we have to act right now <laughs> and do something in order to comply to our targets and not uh, to wait until 2030, 35, and then hopefully uh, we can uh, uh, produce hydrogen on, on, on very large scale economically and so on. And uh, these are really, uh, really significant uh, CO2 prices. Here we are talking already about 200 and 400 euros per ton CO2 in the next five to 10 years. And uh, this is, uh, let's say some more or less uh, conclusions from my presentation right now, some findings. So it's very important. These are not overall now policy recommendations or conclusions of the entire open entrance project. So it's, uh, let's say it's a milestone now. Our exercises we have uh, conducted here on uh, on aggregated European level. These are first insights also for us as a consortium. Uh, and uh, hopefully also we get feedback from you uh, on the open platform. So how to improve everything and uh, all these inputs, of course, will be taken into consideration and then also in the upcoming year for the detailed uh, country specific uh, input data scaling and uh, uh, improvement uh, of the settings and constraints in general. But uh, only a few highlights, five, six highlights. So if we want to comply to the 1.5 degree target, so we ha have to act right now and, uh, and very, very fast. And our model modeling exercise shows that in 2030, we already shall reduce our CO2 emissions by two thirds compared to right now. So, so this means that we only should have theoretically only one third of today's emissions. So, so then we are safe to, to comply to this target. Uh, and let's say the, the, the least risky strategy is to rely, let, let's say on a di directed transition uh, scenario. So, so, so this means that we need a strong policy uh, gearing uh, already right now to, to, to end up. Uh, we also, of course, if we rather, let's say, think it could also be the techno-friendly or societal commitment, but, but this, this is even more risky because then we rely that, uh, let's say, maybe in 10, 15 years, so, so there will be a, a take up of all these expectations, uh, how, uh, let's say, the storylines uh, describe uh, these scenarios. And uh, just a few now. Hans, you're approaching the end, I assume. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we oh, are okay, on yeah. slightly on overtime. So. Oh, okay, so, so we are already in overtime. So this is the last slide. So here I just want to, uh, here I just want to uh, uh, show the link to the open platform uh, of the Scenario Explorer, where we uh, invite everybody already to be active. So here the Genesis model and uh, the results I have shown here, they are uh, available for everybody. Uh, and this, uh, let's say, already concludes uh, my pre presentation. And Petra, uh, sorry for being a few minutes uh, in overtime. So that's it. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward uh, to the discussion then afterwards. Um, we, we planned on, also if we had time, we planned on having short questions straight after the presentation. Um, we are slightly on overtime. Uh, there's uh, one question in the chat, which is quite quick to uh, answer. I think uh, we can take that one, but then we'll go straight to the other ones. And there'll be uh, ample uh, possibilities both at the break and afterwards to have a discussion with the uh, with the presenters. So the the question you might be able to answer quickly, uh, Hans, is: Do the scenarios consider interaction between the three dimensions? 
such as between the society policy and techni technology policy interfaces? Or is it just looking at the single, you could say, access uh, so, scenarios? So, so at present, it's the single access, but this is the idea of the open uh, source uh, approach that uh, everybody in the future can, let's say, uh, put the different weights to the different, uh, let's say, characteristics in the storylines and then in the parameter settings that uh, uh, several, let's say, uh, weights and combinations in this uh, cube uh, then can be modeled. But at present, it's, uh, it's the extremes. It's not a combination. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and as I said, it will be possible to talk with Hans uh, in the breaks and more questions can be asked in the panel discussions. Now to uh, Dr. Ivan Matachak from ERA, which is uh, through the SUPERA project, is a co-sponsor of the workshop. Uh, ERA is one of the tools uh, with respect within set plan. Uh, so Ivan, maybe you can introduce yourself. Uh, and when you have given us a short overview of SUPERA, uh, Tina Kolyonen from VTT, which is also part of uh, the SUPERA project, will uh, will will continue. Please, Ivan. Good uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Peter, for this introduction. Just confirming that you can see properly my uh, presentation. Unfortunately, I cannot put it in display mode because for unknown reasons, technical. So That's fine. Uh, I think you can just go ahead, yeah. Okay, let me just present myself briefly. My name is Ivan Mateak. I'm from European Energy Research Alliance. And today I'll be here as the project coordinator of the project SUPERA, which stands the support to the coordination of national research and innovation programs in areas of activities of European Energy Research Alliance. Uh, we as well, well, uh, all areas looking how to reach the climate energy transition and SUPERA in specific uh, tries to um, to do it through the facilitation of implementation of the set plan, but also through different uh, to different tools such as the analysis of NSCPs. And exactly today, I will, I will go through quickly what, from the our point of view, we are doing in this respect. Supera, just for you to know, it's the coordination support action as a such differs a lot from the open address approach, and also it has obviously a different scope. So SUPERA support, as I said, the set plan and the climate transition as a such. And what we uh, say that we facilitate the coordination of the research community in the execution of the set plan. We try to accelerate innovation and uptake by industry. We try to provide recommendation of policy, of course, to promote the set plan and climate transition. Uh, ERA, I said the ELA is the only beneficiary and, uh, of this grant, and they are supported by linked third parties, which are stated here below, KIT, CAA, Sintep, VTU, and VTT. Uh, when it arrives to SUPERA and the NSPs in particular, uh, what we try to do? Uh, we are analyzing, first of all, the energy measures that are within NSPs, so those energy measures that somehow should reach the target set in the Paris Agreement, but also in the high level European Commission policies. Based on this, we try to, to define the pathways between different realities in terms of maturity and regional coverage, maturity in terms of technology and regional coverage between the member states. Then we create the dialogue between industry and energy experts, mostly between uh, industry, uh, regional industry clusters and the joint, program, uh, joint programs of the of ERA. And then the end, we will try after the project ends to, to, well, to lay down a set of recommendations on area by policies deriving from the analysis of NCPs. Uh, a bit of the context. Now we have been hearing, well, how to reach all this scenario, but let's see how we stand. So we had context that I call here de facto. So what we have in the field and the next one is going to be the URE, actually what is written down by the commission. So if you can see on this, uh, this representation, uh, which is from EAA, uh, you can see that uh, although all the nice things that we are talking about, the renewables, the new renewables, are counting only of the 4% of the current uh, energy supply. So uh, it is enough for us to have the low cost, uh, uh, the cost competitive low carbon technology to reach uh, the targets we are talking about, or maybe something else is needed. Because uh, as also Professor Auer said, 
uh, we need to act quickly. But in my opinion, we should have acted already two or three years ago to reach those. So it's quite demanding and quite challenging when you talk about this. So the technology evolution is critical, but not sufficient for sure, the condition to achieve the energy transition. And uh, the two, uh, let's say the two uh, targets, 1.2 or 2.0 uh, on the longer term. So the driving the energy transition uh, should go beyond the technology itself. And there we should also consider the uh, consumer behavior that will affect the entire human society. Uh, this is what we have today. So just 4% of renewable in the whole energy supply as of 2018. Uh, what the commission and what the European Union did it so far. We have a clean energy plan for all. It's a general framework we are asked to, to, to work with. Then uh, we have a European Green Deal, uh, the new policy set down by Ursula von der Leyen with a more detailed and quite ambitious plan uh, to combat climate change with 55% reduction by 2030 uh, versus the current 40% goal. And how they do intend to do that? They asked member states to produce the national energy climate plans uh, by which they're asking them to set down, well, uh, many, many uh, policies and instruments which include uh, five dimensions, the carbonization, energy efficiency, energy security, internal energy market, research, innovation, competitiveness. So uh, what we have, uh, what is our super methodology? We take uh, NSCPs and we start analyzing them in all member states, so 27 member states. We go to the statutes, objectives, to policy and programs, and also we are trying to find out if there are any examples of different countries and regions that we can combine and then show as a best practice. Then we go further, we look to the relevant European framework strategies. For example, today I'm going to show you what we did where we define hydrogen uh, as, a, as a pathway. So for example, we take NSCPs, but we then also look to European hydrogen strategy and we see if they match and if not, how to, how to overcome this gap. And then we establish a dialogue. So we want during the project uh, implementation, we want to uh, put together, as I said before, and the community industry and pilot some of the pathways in the next uh, three years of, of project implementation, which in the end will allow us uh, to identify some, uh, some key cases and then also to pilot them, uh, to pilot them from the moment. So why hydrogen? So we decided to look specifically uh, to several technologies, but today I'll talk to you about hydrogen. Hydrogen because it become a key priority for the European Green Deal and European uh, clean energy transition as such. And as we know, this is especially important in the last two years and especially now after, after the COVID pandemic and the recovery plans. Uh, renewable energy electricity, well, we will have this source, source, but for sure it's not going to be enough to reach the objectives. Uh, hydrogen is excellent to replace fossil fuels, as we know, both in the, in the uh, carbon intensive processes, but also in transport system. Uh, it's potential to use already existing infrastructure. And as I said uh, a few moments ago, uh, it is an excellent opportunity for the member states to invest, so to also boost the recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, hydrogen strategy, it's built uh, on, uh, well, we have three main steps, uh, as you can see here. I will leave this, uh, this presentation nonetheless for your, uh, for your reference. And uh, uh, what are the findings? Well, there are several important findings. Uh, as introduction, I, I, would, I need to tell you that no NSCPs are, well, different NSCPs between different member states are not alike at all. So we have uh, uh, Italian one, for example, that set key actions, but then it doesn't tell how they want to achieve that. Then you have, uh, uh, then you have the Finnish one, which is quite detailed, but then you have Eastern European ones, which are completely disconnected between what is, well, the idea also of the clinical transition as such. So the analysis of this one was quite difficult. These are the findings. So the European industry needs the clarity and the investment needs the certainty in the transition. So, uh, there are many things that yet need to be defined. All the NSCPs have a clear goal, that's good. So the climate energy system integration. 
they are the challenges on the long period. There should be a clear plan how to do that. Although, as I said before, many of, many of these uh, NSCPs doesn't define a clear pathway to, to achieve the targets. And for example, what is a huge problem of NSCPs, they do not, uh, they do not uh, unbend uh, many current policies. For example, your Green uh, Hydrogen Alliance, it's completely absent for the NSCPs because right after. So also these NSCPs, it means that will be need, uh, they need to be readjusted and redefined further on. Um, but as I said, there are also some good practices and good examples of how the NSCPs can, uh, can bring to the, to the scenario we are talking about and to the targets. So we analyze these four uh, main, uh, main aspects on the production, on infrastructure, on creation of market demand and the collaboration. As you can see, there are many, uh, there are some of the member states, they are quite forward in definition of hydrogen as a tool to reach, uh, or to reach uh, uh, climate neutrality in the targets we talk about, uh, both in terms of production and infrastructure. So what is, uh, what is actually here important to state that we are still carrying out this initiative, we are still anal analyzing all the NCPs, which as I said before, will be somehow uh, redefined in the view of the recovery plans, because the recovery plans should go first to NCPs, take the measures that are closer to the market and, and bring them and realize them in the, in, the, in, the, in the wake of pandemic. And on the other side, what also NCPs, some of them are missing completely, are, the, um, are the, all the um, elements of the set plan. If you read, for example, the Italian, uh, Italian NCP, it mentioned just one, once in the 400 pages, uh, what about the set plan? And we are all somehow working for the execution of set plan. So there's really challenge, uh, plenty of challenges, but also plenty of potential to have the NSCPs as a, as a good tool for the reach of the targets and also to achieve mm -hmm. climate neutral uh, society. Thank you very much. Uh, I will leave it to, to, to Tina, uh, Peter, for it's yours. Thank you. If you stop sharing, uh, Ivan, then uh, Tina can start sharing. <laughs> uh, Tina, you've also been part of the Spera, and uh, the rest of the presentation from Spera is uh, yours. And please give a short introduction to who you are. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, my name is Tina Kolyonen and I'm coming from VTT Technikar Research Center of Finland. At VTT we are doing a lot of uh, scenario studies to support uh, the policy making in Finland but also support other countries. So I will shortly give an overview about uh, as an example of uh, what is happening in Finland but uh, can you show my slides please? Just to warn, I have had some uh, serious connection po problems today, so, but hopefully everything will be working today. So next, please. So this is just a shortcut what is really happening at the moment in Finland. So Finland has a carbon neutrality target uh, 2035. At the moment, we are working with preparation of our new climate and energy policies and strategies and new climate law. So Finland has had a climate law for many years, but uh, it is now the time when we are updating the climate law in parallel to the strategy and, and policy making. Uh, as an example, the climate law, um, that is not only about uh, the 2050 uh, targets for greenhouse gas emissions. It will set up the 2035 net zero target, but also the milestones uh, in between. So what is really needed for 2030, what is needed for 2040, and then finally 2050. And this is also about what is really the carbon budget for Finland if we look at the goals of Paris Agreement. 
We are now working with the climate and energy strategy up to 2040. Uh, that will be finalized, hopefully, next fall. Uh, so there really will be a new policies and measures how to reach carbon neutrality in Finland. In parallel, we are also updating new medium-term climate policy plan that is also for 2030. So the medium-term policy, climate policy plan is, is only for burden sharing sector. So this strategy and climate policy plan are, of course, these are established in parallel. In addition to that, uh, just beginning of this year, um, it was also uh, launched the fossil fee free transport by 2045. So the roadmap. And in fact, uh, this work will also uh, continue. Uh, it's continue already today, but uh, also still continuing uh, next fall. So why I'm talking about this, uh, in Ivan's presentation, you were talking about NECPs. But for example, what we are seeing now in Finland, NECPs are already now rather old policies. So there will be a new baseline. So the with existing measures, uh, that was also written in the NECPs. So uh, the Governance Directive uh, gives the rules how to uh, establish the with existing measures. Uh, in our new baseline, we'll include the 2030 policies, so those are already implemented. And then about the new policy scenario, so what additional measures. So that will be used also for the updating of the NECP in 2022. So this is just to give an example that the process is really, really ongoing. So when we are publishing the NECPs, uh, we are already then uh, one step ahead. So next, please. Uh, so you are about the first ones to see our new preliminary with existing measure uh, for greenhouse gas emissions. So this is really a preliminary. I know that there are already now some updates. Um, as you see that already in the with existing measures, uh, which is now under construction, uh, the greenhouse gas mitigation up to 2030 is already really pretty high in Finland. So we already have a law which says that coal will be phased out by 2029. Uh, the new government program says that we need to at least half the peat use in Finland. In Finland, we also will have a new nuclear, but of course, other renewables, especially wind, will uh, play a big role. Uh, as you imagine, there will be a large reduce, uh, reduction in, in transport sector, but also the building sector. And then the quick question, what really is that, what was also presented, uh, what is really the price development of the EU allowance as an example? And what is also really happening with the EU Green Deal? So what is really, for example, the Fit for 55 in, with, the, with additional measures? So these are the very, very high uncertainties what we are facing when we are now running the scenarios in Finland, and especially if we think about how open entrance could support, these are the things we are looking for now. Next, please. Another preliminary, very fresh results from uh, electricity supply in with existing measures, so including the policies and measures we already now have until 2030. As you see, pretty high uh, share is still uh, with the nuclear in Finland. So uh, we are expecting that the share of nuclear will be increasing. So this is the opposite compared to as example for, for Germany. Coal will be really phased out. Uh, and the other fossil uh, peat is also phased out. But then we are also having a large share of biomass. So that mainly comes from the forest industries, 
but uh, also uh, a little bit also from uh, district heating uh, and uh, combined heat and power sector. Wind is a big, big question mark. So the quick question is really that when we are looking at the situation in Finland, so what will happen in Nordics? As an example, are the wind investments going to happen in Finland or is it more competitive, uh, uh, economical to invest in, in our neighboring countries? So not only Sweden and Norway, but also the Baltics and the offshore, especially the offshore region uh, uh, when we are talking about wind. And then what is really happening uh, in Central Europe? So the, if we are talking about export and import electricity. Next, please. Then I come back to the far transport sector, because when we are looking at the transport sector in Finland and compared to the uh, average EU level uh, scenarios, which were also shown in, in the previous uh, presentation. Uh, you can also learn a little bit Finnish there because sorry, these are, some of the slides are in, in Finnish because we are doing this for the Finnish government. So you can see that um, this is now the policy, uh, policy uh, scenario already. Fossil diesel, that will phase out by 2045. Fossil gasoline, the same story by 2045. But how to really replace them? We have a pretty high uh, share of uh, second generation biofuels. Electricity, it will enter there. But you can see that, that probably this is not so uh, fast compared to some other uh, European countries and especially Norway. Biogas will be important. But what is even more important is that uh, when we are talking about hydrogen, uh, I, I, has been, uh, I have been looking at the EU level scenarios and hydrogen was also discussed uh, uh, in the uh, previous uh, presentation by Ivan. But um, when we are talking about in, in Finland, the hydrogen, it is more about going uh, not to use directly hydrogen, but going more like a synthetic e-fuels. So power to gas and power to liquids. Interesting question is also that uh, we just uh, received uh, very, very uh, <laughs> new news that the Finnish company Neste will invest in Rotterdam, the new biodiesel plant. So where, where we will really uh, get all this biodiesel in the future. So that will be also a challenge. And then it will be important to look at the EU and the other EU countries as well. And the urgency. In Finland, we have uh, our uh, ambitions uh, to uh, get rid of fossils. Is, is, I guess that this is higher than when we are comparing to the average EU level. Next, please. One slide about industry. Uh, industry, you have, you see uh, on the left hand side, uh, uh, the steel industries in Finland. Uh, there is the ongoing process and, uh, and uh, uh, project uh, in collaboration with uh, Finland and Sweden, where they will be this, uh, instead of uh, using coke, is, is we are going moving, they are going moving to more like hydrogen. And in the industrial sector, it's also important that uh, it is uh, high electrification and also use of hydrogen instead of uh, fossil uh, raw materials and fuels. In that sense, it's also very important to look at that, uh, how the development of, of EU's infrastructure and electricity markets uh, are really uh, happening. So because these two are really, really essential for the success and, and we are so that we are able to implement the policies and measures and going towards the carbon neutrality. Next, please. So this is my last slide. So uh, I just tried to highlight some examples that why we are really looking for EU level collaboration. It is about EU level scenarios. It is also the collaboration between member states. 
And then we are coming back to analyzing also the other NECPs and all long-term strategies. So we really need the holistic understanding and collaboration to ensure the fair transition. So thank you very much. Petra, you're muted um, if you're talking to us. Unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, thank you, Tina. Uh, I think both you and uh, your and uh, Ivan's presentation showed the necessity to kind of couple the national efforts with the uh, overall European uh, and you could say global scenarios. And um, as Hans said in the beginning, uh, the next step is to kind of uh, show what the model uh, or connect the model to the national uh, national detail. And uh, I, I think the collaboration between, you could say, uh, ERA and Supera's contact with the member states uh, and the open uh, entrance project is a, is a good link that we should push uh, forward with. Uh, we will go straight uh, to the last presentation before the panel, first panel. panel. Uh, Carlo uh, Heinz and uh, Konstantin Löffler, uh, please take control of, uh, of the screen and go ahead. Can you already see my screen? Yes. Uh, then thank you yeah. for, that, for that introduction. Um, my name is Carlo Heinz. I'm working at the Technical University in Berlin and I will speak uh, for myself and for my colleague uh, Konstantin Löffler as well. Um, so just one presentation now, condensed everything. And um, I'm, I'm happy to show you basically findings from recent work that we did, which are based on the presentation that Hans showed you a couple of minutes ago, um, talking about European decarbonization pathways also outside of open entrance and see if there's robust findings across studies. Um, what methodologies can we apply there? And then also trying to bridge again uh, the gap to the European Green Deal and see what, uh, how the consideration there is. And um, I will cut this uh, introduction short, also due to time constraints. I'm sure all of you are aware of the European Green Deal and the pledge for greenhouse gas neutrality by 2050, which comes with it. And this pledge comes at a time where decarbonization pathways of the European energy system, but also of national energy systems, as we just saw now uh, by Tina, uh, but also global ones are basically on the rise and a large number is being published every year. However, what becomes, or what becomes increasingly complex is the communication of the results of these pathways. Uh, it becomes more and more complicated, more complex, the more scenarios there are, the more things there are to take into account. Um, and this basically raises the question of uh, how, how can we as, as researchers and as modelers try to, to convey our results to decision and policy makers in a way uh, that this uh, that they can work with them without putting too much time into trying to understand the results and trying to understand why they look the way they look. Um, as a quick uh, anecdote, I'm sure all modelers here at least will know the quote from George E.P. Box, uh, which is all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, and coming back, a fact that often I won't say is forgotten, but seems to be neglected is, the strength of model does not really lie in the provision of absolute numbers and single numbers. Um, that's not where models are good, especially now Hans alluded to it earlier, uh, scenario analysis is not trying to show how the world would be, but how the world could be. So this is basically where all models are wrong. The question is, when do they become useful? And they become useful if scenarios, if results are being compared, not necessarily to, to results only from the same model, but also from other ones. Um, but this is basically where strength of model lies and um, we as, as modelers have to make sure to, uh, to transmit this message. Um, so reviews and comparison are, are quite an essential part of, of communicating model results. And uh, lately there has been a very comprehensive work by uh, Tsiropoulos et al from the Joint Research Center, uh, which analyzed European decarbonization pathways, which have been published between 2017 and 2019. 
Um, they analyzed 26 publications consisting of 67 scenarios in total. And interestingly, out of these 67 scenarios, only eight of them, um, so let's say about 12%, reach both the long-term goal of almost decarbonization of the energy system by 2050, as well as the ambitious or more ambitious climate targets in the near term until 2030 uh, of 55% as pledged by, by the European Green Deal. Uh, the 60% as discussed by the European Parliament is uh, basically never achieved anywhere. Um, but what the authors also find is that A, um, the, the numerical evidence for reaching these climate targets is not always really provided in these studies, which is a very interesting fact considering that uh, this, is, this is one of the main tools when, when driving policies is the decarbonization targets at certain years. And the other one is that there was large discrepancies, not in the overall findings of, of the studies, if you're looking at the bigger picture, but when going into detail. Uh, as an example, I put here basically uh, uh, an extract of results when it comes to carbon capture and storage quantities. Um, and in 13 scenarios where almost near decarbonization was achieved by 2050, across these 13 scenarios, the values for carbon captured and stored differed between 36 megaton CO2 per year and 466. That's factor 12. Um, also, there's other studies which either say and state that there is no carbon capture and storage, so it's zero and others who do not provide any information on it, so it's unclear how far this is being used. But this already shows a, a huge problem when, when analyzing a single scenario or study that um, then the values when it comes to these details uh, can vary quite significantly and it's only with the help of extensive knowledge of input assumptions and the overall structure of models that one can explain and understand these results uh, in a way that would be necessary. Um, you are familiar with this 3D scenario generation process. I will dive now into our work that we've been doing. And this generation or three-dimensional process is not only suitable for the generation of pathways, which you could see uh, two presentations ago, three by Hans, but it's also suitable for assessing the scope of other scenarios, uh, an exercise which we have conducted in, in our work where taking 16 decarbonization pathways in more detail, among others, uh, we basically highlight what aspects across these three dimensions are included or stated at least by um, the authors of the respective studies when it comes to what their, their scenarios tackle. And here you can let's see a small example of one of these studies, uh, one of these tables that we have, um, where we, we show that in the technological side, usually there is more detail the models being techno-economic models, that's also to be expected because that's their, their inherent strength. Um, what, what also can be found is that societal and behavioral assumptions or uh, changes are quite rare in the current literature, um, which is an interesting fact, which uh, can basically easily be seen once this, this exercise here is done. And it also helps in the comparison of the different scenarios when it comes to analyzing the results. Now, what we did is uh, out of these 16 uh, decarbonization pathways that we analyzed, um, we wanted to take a closer look at some of them, because if I tell you here the whole time that you have to compare uh, energy scenarios against others, that's also something we wanted to do with our open entrance pathways. So not to have them standing alone in, in like the void, but trying to put them into the context of other scenarios which has been conducted by other research institutes or institutions. Um, and we found two studies with a very similar methodology and scope of the analysis, those being the Clean Planet for All uh, study and the deployment scenarios for low carbon energy technologies from the uh, Low Carbon Energy Observatory, which both have multiple scenarios being analyzed, but in particular three of the, I think in total it's 12, uh, fit very well with uh, the general idea of the of the pathways, those being high degrees of decarbonization, basically reaching zero, uh, zero carbon in 2050, and also using a similar kind of models, which, uh, are, which is also important when, when taking a look at scenarios, because uh, the, the boundaries your analysis has and the interface of these boundaries is very, very crucial for the result analysis and the shape of the results. So we wanted to make sure that these are at least very similar. Um, so we took a look at these uh, three scenarios, 
uh, we will show now like results for four KPIs. Uh, thankfully, data was available, which also Hans alluded to earlier is very important in human work as well. Uh, data availability is, is so important in our field of research um, and even was provided additional information by the authors uh, upon request. So we're very thankful for that. I'm very happy about this. Um, going into the, the exact comparison now, I'll show you four graphs and our instinct as, as researchers and modelers generally is uh, let's find the difference, who can spot the differences. And although this is a very uh, reasonable way of approaching these scenarios, also one has to highlight that they look very similar. And when trying to find out what common findings can be, what robust results can be, this is actually where one can or should start to see what are common findings found across everything. Um, now looking here at this slide, we see the uh, comparison of final energy consumption. On the left hand side, we see it as aggregated per fuel, while on the right hand side, it's just aggregated per sectors. Um, and we see first, let's stick with the fuels that we see a very, very similar build. Electricity will make up 40, 50, 60 percent of total energy consumption uh, in, in 2050. Um, the difference in the way of like, for example, uh, the blue, I'm not sure if you can read it on the slides, but on the left graph, the blue uh, area is heat, or more specifically industry heat, um, is something that isn't reported in the open entrance graph, so which is why it's not in there. Um, but apart from that, they look very similar with obviously the respective differences when uh, when when necessary. Generally, the 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 Come, uh, the final amount of energy consumption is a little bit higher in the open entrance scenarios. This is uh, due to multiple reasons. Um, one of them is that the uh, one that the clean plan for all studies for the 1.5 degrees, um, so life and tech, they assume high amounts of demand reduction, reduction or uh, also high uh, degree of technological development. Um, and also the representation of certain sectors might differ across the studies, especially the industry sector, where the degree of, of detail can, uh, can change a lot in terms of the results uh, when it comes to which processes are being modeled, which temperature levels are being le modeled. Is it more an aggregated one or disaggregated? Uh, this is where, where a lot comes into play. Um, taking a quick look at the right-hand side, uh, figure we see buildings is quite constant across all the sectors, always averaging about 40% of the final energy consumption. Uh, and then there seems to be a trade-off between industry and transport. Uh, now my thesis that I'm going to put out now, I'm going to uh, also uh, trying to prove with my next slide as well, is that this trade-off is mainly due to the amount of hydrogen and synthetic fuels being used uh, in, in the different sectors as well as the availability of breakthrough technologies when it comes to electrification of these sectors. Um, so uh, without further ado, going to the next slide, on the left hand side we can see the electrification rate. Let's stick with this one. So it's the electrification rate in the sector. So how much of the final energy consumed by these sectors is directly being produced by electricity? Not indirectly, so hydrogen here wouldn't count towards uh, electrification. Um, and we see that transportation, the red triangles, as well as buildings, the blue dots, are very similar or very stable across all the studies. There is not no much change here. Industry seems to fluctuate a little bit more. And the reason for this, what we found, is um, mainly due to the availability of CCS. So the moment CCS is readily available uh, and uh, economically feasible, uh, there is more fossil fuel being used in, in, the, in the industry sector um, and then obviously less is being electrified. Now the one difference is the techno-friendly scenario, that's the, the, the black sheep if you want to call it that way. And um, so transportation has an incredible high degree of electrification with 70% and industry is comparably low. And the reason here is that in a techno-friendly scenario we went as far as to allow overhead trolley trucks for freight transportation. Freight transportation is one of the most difficult to decarbonize uh, well, energy sectors, if you so want to call it. Um, and road transportation basically is uh, there isn't really any, any feasible way of large scale batteries for, for road transportation, except for, or electrification, but except for if there's overhead trolley trucks, which here are being allowed, 
which leads to this huge amount of 70% in transportation. Uh, vice versa, uh, there is more hydrogen now being free because it's not being required in the transportation uh, sector anymore. So this one can be used in the industry sector together with carbon capture and storage, uh, which is why this year is a little bit lower. Um, looking at the capacities required, um, first, it can be seen that capacities rise across all different scenarios. Uh, another common finding which is very important and that basically can be found across the literature in every study. Um, the open entrance pathway in 2030, which is here on the left hand side of the graph, show that or show a little bit higher capacities compared to the other ones in general. This can be attributed to also the higher decarbonization uh, amounts which are being achieved at least by three of the four uh, pathways and open entrance, which Hans already, uh, already alluded to earlier, is about 65%. Uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction uh, in 2030, while the others uh, achieve uh, around 50-55 percent. Um, in 2050, we see that the technology-based pathways, so the techno-friendly from open entrance, as well as the 1.5 tech from Clean Planet for All study, are very similar when it comes to basically the required capacities and total, as well as the share of the different energy carriers um, or generation technologies. The odd sheep here is the uh, LCEO result, which shows incredibly high uh, amounts of capacities. Some of them can definitely be attributed also to the fact that hydrogen is being used in the power sector itself. You can see the, the light blue uh, area on the right bar. Um, this hydrogen, A, being used in the electricity sector, obviously increases the, the amount of fuel here, and B, also has to produce somehow. And then, I mean, Thermodynamics teaches us the more the more energy conversion there is uh, on the way, the more losses you have. So this is where uh, capacities are required for. Um, and then after after now showing you these these similarities and differences, um, we want to go back to the three dimensional approach that that we introduced uh, in the scenario generation process and the scenario evaluation process, and we want to see um, what finding or what action plans which are defined in the European Green Deal, um, what uh, or how are they represented in our model findings and the key findings that we have? Is there anything we can take out, out of our analysis? Um, seeing that we're short on time, I will briefly go over this and then happily answer any questions uh, later or also in the break. Um, to reference back to the to the presentation earlier, um, for example, in the industry sector, we can see uh, basically across all studies that it's being stated that something which might be difficult to model, but it's still very important is um, that industry needs to have security, regulate, re regulatory security uh, about how future developments will pay out in order to, to make investments accordingly. Um, apart from that, the electricity sector, most of this is basically already common knowledge when it comes to decarbonizing uh, and having more renewable energies. Um, and uh, well, yeah, if there is any more, any more questions here, please, I'm very happy to answer them. Um, but concluding everything, I wanna say that with the wide range of decarbonization studies existing in the literature, analyzing and, interpre and interpreting the results becomes even more important. Um, and this is something which shouldn't be forgotten among, uh, among us, among study publishers. Um, the European Green Deal covers a lot of relevant and required areas of action, definitely, and it's a, it's a good step towards this, and it also sparked new analysis and new studies being conducted. Um, something which we found generally is that sufficiency aspects are basically not yet covered enough, neither in the European Green Deal nor in energy system modeling, or for that matter, related modeling, which doesn't directly target sufficiency aspect, um, which an interesting question for, for others as well, but for future research uh, would be, is there a correlation between us? Is this just something which isn't, uh, isn't communicated uh, to decision makers enough, or is it just that there isn't enough, uh, enough there, or is it, is it not possible to, to uh, put, excuse me, to put, uh, decisions regarding sufficiency or regulatory frameworks regarding sufficiency in the European Green Deal. 
Um, and the three-dimensional scenario uh, generation approach is not only a scenario generation approach, but also an evaluation approach, which is very helpful when, when analyzing and trying to compare results. And with that, I uh, thank you for, for your attention. Um, I'm happy to answer questions, as I said, and I hand back over to Peter. Thank you, uh, Carlo. Um, uh, I, I, I think the uh, very interesting or illustrative uh, part of your presentation was that the three dimensions uh, kind of set up a space and uh, you showed how kind of how you can start moving in the space instead of just following uh, one of the dimensions and um, uh, also by by actually comparing it to other scenarios on on how to get there and and that, that's kind of the type of uh, discussion comparison we invite others to join us in in open entrance now we have created this uh, space <laughs> and please come join us in kind of discussing how to move through this space in order to kind of best possibly uh, get to the um, to, to to the goal and i am um, I, I i also I, th I think it's good for modelers as you said in your introduction to kind of um, think about what your model does actually and and um, uh, the, the the big scare for people watching modelers is uh, to end up with a modeler that uh, believes that uh, his model is more real than the world itself. Uh, but I, I I think we're quite quite some way uh, away from that. Um, let's see. I cannot see that there was a question straightly uh, also directly to your presentation. So what I I think you brought us back on track. Thank you, uh, time-wise. Um, I, I, I think we have time for, um, say, uh, four minutes a break so that people can kind of have a bio break or go get a cup of coffee before the panel starts. So be back at uh, 14.05 precisely. And, uh, I'll just say uh, the first presentation will be by uh, Paolo Pichella. Pichella. Pichella, yeah, correct. Yeah. Uh, so please go ahead. Thank you. So um, I'll just uh, reshare this. Oops, I moved a little bit too much. Uh, uh, I can perfectly well see your screen. Uh, yeah. Which one are you looking at? The one with notes or the one with the no, just just the full screen. Also, okay, uh, you can see cooperation in the European uh, trans energy transition, right? Yes. Good. Okay, then. Uh, so good afternoon. Uh, I am uh, Paolo Vichella. I'm researcher at uh, at uh, NTNU, at the Department of Industrial Economics and Technology Management, and my focus is on the evaluation of macroeconomic impact of uh, green transition policies. Uh, I will present an economic evaluation of the effects of decarbonization in different European countries, considering the push provided by carbon prices, and on the other hand, the pool provided by technology development, as well as consumption development. So the work uh, is, is, is still partially ongoing, but uh, the results come from a collaboration with uh, my colleagues Thorsten Burent from uh, TU Berlin and Pedro uh, Crespo de Granado from uh, Antenu, which is here, is uh, one of the organizers, so you know him quite well. Uh, so this is the, the outline of the presentation. Uh, I will introduce the motivation, then touch briefly on the models employed and their linkage. Then I will introduce the scenarios that we have developed for this exercise, which were devised, well, well a word of warning here, the, the scenarios we have used were devised before the definition of the open entrance pathways, so they do not have all the features of these scenarios pre previously introduced. So I will introduce the scenario that we have for, for this exercise that we have made. Then I will briefly, uh, then I will exp ex uh, present results that we have out of it. So uh, as we know, the plan is to decarbonize Europe by 2050. And some countries have in the past shown some sign of skepticism over the climate goals and mentioned that they would call off the agreement. Uh, our question is then has been uh, one: What are the effects of a transition towards a cleaner economy for Europe? And two: 
what happens if there is a defection by a group of countries. Uh, so we have defined for these four scenarios based on two drivers. One is the level of decarbonization and the other driver is the level of cooperation between countries. So some of the questions we might want to answer are considering, for example, if an increase in productivity for renewable sources is good enough or large enough to offset the lack of fossil fuels in the future. Uh, or if the pull by the technology development is strong enough to cope with the push by the policy, which is mainly modeled as uh, as carbon budget. And also if the countries have the same effect from a decarbonization policy and why. So and if, in, if, if there is somebody who is calling the, off the agreements, is there any possible countermeasure? And economically analyze that. So what we have done is we have uh, we have analyzed the problem by soft linking uh, remes eu and genesis mod remes eu is a uh, is a uh, multi country cg model considering several types of fuels and the effect of co2 budget into the economic system it considers actually 28 countries which is 20 eu 27 minus croatia but including switzerland and norway genesis mod is one of the most <laughs> used or mentioned models in this uh, workshop is a bottom-up energy system model capable of computing the future mix of energy technology used by different sectors based on a global least cost approach and using a detailed technology representation. So this is how we have linked the models. Uh, Genesis Mod provides a technology dynamic dynamics of the of basically the technology changes in terms of energy inputs that are requested by the different sectors and also for final consumption we can see it here technology mix i don't know if i can uh, well uh, point eruptions maybe I can then a laser pointer so technology mix is passed from genesis mode to remis u and remis u computes an equilibrium between demand and supply as the technology and policy so we have demand and supply of different commodities as the policy policy changes and provides genesis mode with the level of sectoral activity with the CO2 prices and we elect the electricity demand by sector. Uh, so another word of warning here. So we've been updating the models to keep improving the results until quite recently. Therefore, we haven't achieved yet a full convergence between the two models. Actually, we have made a couple of iterations uh, among them. So the analysis in this regard can be viewed as an economic evaluation of the results provided by Genesis Mod for the scenarios that we have defined which are not the uh, stress it again is not they're not exactly are not the, the scenarios that are uh, in defined in the open entrance uh, project but somehow close but they were defined de devised before uh, the, the open entrance uh, open entrance uh, scenarios were computed so going on one word also about the harmonization of the models so uh, we've been harmonizing the there has been an harmonizing process between the inputs of different sectors. And it has been one of the most challenging activities since the databases are not using the same units. Remus uses monetary units while Genesis Mod database uses physical units. Sometimes there are commodities that are present in the social accounting matrix for, for the Remus model, for the CGE model, which are not featured in the technical data set from the energy system model. And on top of that, the percentage shares at the beginning are rather different. This is power, for example, 2005 from, from uh, 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 Remes and so the social accounting metrics, and this is the value that we receive from, from uh, Genesis Mod. And it's, uh, this is about physical quantity of power. So, so uh, basically they, they, they have some quite some differences and, and they needed to, to be harmonized somehow. So we have we have uh, we have used some methodology, like for example, if both the database have the commodity, then the change the change is applied from Genesis mod to Remis, and it's multiplicative, which means that it grows or decreases at the same rate, starting from the initial point. If Remis does not have the commodity at the beginning, then the change is additive. If Genesis mod doesn't have the commodity at the beginning, but it's in the social accounting metrics of Remis then it's phased out only using uh, only under the decarbonization scenario. And if we are speaking about fossil fuels, the fossil fuel is phased out, for example. I'm not sure if I can spot a, an example very fast here, but there are some, some of them. I guess diesel, for example, is not here at all. 
in the Genesis mod, but it's here in Remus, and it's phased out. So these are the scenarios that we have devised based on these two drivers. So depending on the level of decarbonization and on the level of cooperation, we have four scenarios. In, the, in all the scenarios, we have an expansion of renewable uh, sources, the power sector. Uh, in the business as usual scenario, scenario, so we have basically with no decarbonization or limited decarbonization, and then we have the decarbonization scenario. Uh, in the business as usual, we have uh, low policy push, so there is not uh, the, the carbon budget does not go much below uh, today's level or, or 1990s level. Uh, with with a higher so their carbon budget is basically higher while in the decarbonization policy case we have a lower carbon budget with it goes down by 90 percent compared to 2000 and uh, to 1990 sorry which is not that different from 2005 anyway carbon budget are also in this case when there is no cooperation the carbon budget so if we go down here the carbon budget is discarded for the visa grab group in case of no cooperation. So it's they basically not having any carbon budget, uh, um, any carbon budget uh, cap. So we will, what we'll do, uh, I'll focus on the business as usual scenario and compare it with the carbonization scenario and then touch briefly on what happens when there is no cooperation. So what are the assumptions in the macroeconomic model? These are the main assumptions. So we have uh, CO2 allowances that need to purchase by every sector consuming fossil fuels, so we didn't make a difference between the sectors that are under the CO2 policy and the sectors that are not, but we are assumed that all of them, all of them using fossil fuels need to purchase CO2 allowances. CO2 budget is also defined per country. Technical change is an input from uh, the energy system model, as I as shown a couple of slides ago. Uh, we have energy intensity improving over time, different per country. Uh, we don't model carbon intensity though, and the exports of hydrogen have the same structure in terms of percentages of the export of natural gas that we have today. Hydrogen will be active in the future, so we don't have yet a, uh, a stable export system. Uh, also, the renewable sources productivity in increase, so the, the, the renewable power productivity increases by 6% every five years in the business as usual scenario. And this is taken from a, a recent paper by uh, by Eder and uh, and their colleagues. It's a paper published in uh, Empirica 2021. So, Andreas Eder. Uh, also, effects of COVID COVID-19 are not modeled. So these are these are the differences between the business as usual and the decarbonization scenario. We have uh, in, in terms of CO2 budget, we reduce the CO2 budget by 60% compared to 1990 in the business as usual, whereas we reduce it to by 90% compared to 1990 in the decarbonization case. In both cases, we have in, in the inclusion of a hydrogen sector. Uh, in both cases, we the, we have a sort of transition towards. Uh, uh, hydrogen, biofuels, and electricity, but but in the business as usual, it's much more mild compared to the, the to uh, under the decarbonization case. Uh, in both cases, we have energy efficiency. The diffusion of renewables are, is modeled by an increase in productivity growth, as I said before, six percent every five years in the uh, business as usual, and ten percent every five years in the decarbonization. We assume that there is going to be this is this is sort of a guesstimate here. Here, this is taken by a paper. Uh, this is sort of a guesstimate, assuming that there will be even a, ma a major improvement in technology for renewables. And at the end, also we have extraction of fossil fuels, which is phased out uh, in in the decarbonization. Basically, we have a decrease of 50% extraction every five years. And here we have that in 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 business as usual, we have that it doesn't increase; it stays at 2007, 2005 levels. So what are the macroeconomic effects? We move to the macroeconomic analysis. Still, these analysis are basically an economic evaluation of the system transition proposed by the bottom-up energy system model. Uh, the the bottom-up energy system model provides the development, as I said before, of the technology mix. And the economic model evaluates the change in prices, consumption, and profitability. So since the point of first impact of the shocks are on the demand of energy commodities, we start from the development of this demand under the two scenarios with, with collaboration in this case. 
So we can observe that there is an overall decrease of energy consumption, and it depends on the on two factors. Once we one we have increasing energy efficiency, and two the second driver is the, is the carbon budget. So we have a decrease or the decrease is also due to, to carbon budget, and in fact we can see that the electricity gets a, a major uh, it's an increasing let's say presence in in the in the mix also in the business as usual. Also, it's due to the technology mix that changes, of course, with time. In the decarbonization case, uh, the scenario, uh, electricity, hydrogen, and biofuel basically take over mostly electricity. Then we have here we have biofuels, and there is this slight amount of also uh, of hydrogen that is uh, is uh, covering the demand. Uh, we can also see, yeah, that that natural gas is not completely phased out still. A little bit used and also coal is used a little bit. So what happens to emissions uh, in, in the two cases? In the first case we have a sort of a linear decrease uh, it's, and, and of everything and the proportion yeah it's pretty much similar for all of them but we can see that industry here is not decreasing that much the consumption of, 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 uh, of fossil or basically it's still making emissions so it's still consuming some fossil fuels and this is even more clear here in case of decarbonization we are decreasing uh, a lot the uh, emissions from different uh, sources but uh, but industry doesn't decrease them completely or not as much as the others at least at the other sectors uh, so we see that uh, basically we know that what what is happening is is due to the technology mix development and uh, industry does not completely get get rid of natural gas, heavy distillate, and some other fuels. So this is due to the shift in technology mix. This is basically happening slowly compared to how much we want to decarbonize by policy. This means also that uh, and, uh, and that industry will have to pay a big penalty in terms of CO2 allowances. So the the takeaway of this draw of the graphs is that if the uh, push by the decarbonization policy by decreasing the uh, carbon budget is stronger than the pool by the change in technology, there will be some consequences in terms of prices, in terms of you know taxes, carbon budget in this case, so CO2 prices. Uh, also to give an idea of the expenditure for CO2 allowances, this is the pro pro projected CO2 prices by the model. So in the decarbonization scenario, the CO2 price is more than six times the one in the business as usual scenario. And next, so also we have the, we want to see what is the implication on the transition, of this transition on energy prices. Uh, we see the business as usual here. This is for Germany. So I, have, I had to pick one, uh, one country. I picked one uh, that is quite large. Uh, so, uh, so this is case of business as usual. This is the case of decarbonization. Uh, we can see that in the business as usual, prices tend to decrease. And this is in proportion to the, to the cons consumer price index due to the efficient energy efficiency with the exception of heavy distillate, which is the green here, and, and electricity. So electricity price increases due to the large, to the increased usage in the industry. And well, the, there is a growth also in production because of the, of the productivity that is increasing, but it's slower in the business as usual compared to the uh, decarbonization case. Heavy distillate prices here, they increase because it's production, it uh, does, does not increase any longer because we are uh, fixing the extraction of fossil fuels at levels that were in 2005, for example. But, um, but uh, it even grows by technology change in, for example, aluminum production. So in, the, in case of decarbonization here, there is a large increase of heavy distillate prices because still the same reason, it's still used by industry and, and in aluminum, for example, but, uh, but there is a huge decrease in extraction of fossil fuels uh, with time. So this increases the prices of, uh, of uh, heavy distillate and also of fuels for the same reason. Um, electricity prices in this case, uh, it de decreases because there is, a where, where is electricity, it's here, it's decreasing. And uh, we have a much larger, uh, because we have a much larger diffusion of re renewable, we have modeled 
a much larger diffusion of renewable sector by, by productivity. And also, uh, we can see that, um, where is it? Hydrogen, it's, uh, it's uh, down here. So it's, it also decreases because, well, with time, it's, we, have, we have an initial small increase, but then it starts decreasing because basically hydrogen, uh, it's not used as much as we could expect as, as a proposal from the, from the bottom-up uh, energy system model. So the proposal is not uh, giving us a lot of usage of hydrogen, therefore the price decreases. Also, this is uh, this decrease in price is an indication that the development proposed yeah, by the energy system model is not fast enough to accommodate for energy, for hydrogen-based uh, energy. Well, of course, with more iterations that we, uh, as I said, we just had a couple of iterations. With more iterations, this might be adjusted and the price of hydrogen might slightly increase because it will be more used in the, in the uh, system. So in this chart, I have considered the aggregated price per macro group of uh, production inputs. So basically, this is not, uh, it's, it's, it's a price that is computed by, uh, uh, by macro groups. So we have an energy group, capital group, labor, and materials. So we have four macro groups. And these aggregates are different per sector and per country. Therefore, uh, the prices might change from sector to sector for the same aggregate. Materials in industry is not the same as materials in services. So we can notice that in agriculture, there is a very high increase in price for energy. This is due to, the, to a large purchase of biofuels, and uh, which is almost not produced at the beginning, but this is also a way of the, uh, it, it also depends on the way that it has been modeled, uh, that the, the uh, possibility of exchanging classical agricultural production with biofuels. So this is something that might change in uh, future uh, uh, runs. Uh, and Paolo, we are on overtime. So if you're approaching the end soon. Sure. Uh, yeah. sure. So basically the end is I can jump to the conclusion directly. <laughs> so so, so uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of things to say in 20 minutes. So. Uh, Basically, what is happening is that uh, so the, the the message I want to convey is that uh, um, that uh, uh, energy intensity in improvement alongside CO two budget reduction in lead to a decrease in energy usage. Uh, in so this is quantity variation is decreasing. Uh, not all the sector managed to get rid of old fuels. Industry keeps having uh, using heavy distillate and other fuels, this may, makes uh, it subject to high CO2 prices, and it reduces also the, you, sorry, the, 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 it reduces the, the, the demand for capital, labor, and materials. Um, also, gen generally, sectors reduce the consumption of, of energy, uh, and first also prices for electricity and hydrogen decrease in the long run because of the, of the supply that is increasing a lot. Uh, the, the reduction of demand for energy, also due to increased costs for CO2, uh, reduces also the demand for labor capital compared to this, uh, this is compared to the business as usual. So, and, and of course, this unfortunately leads to a decrease in value added for many sectors. So besides hydrogen and renewable power that are increasing. So basically the overall GDP uh, slows its increase. So if I can show the GDP by country and we have the business as usual, and then we have this, the carbonization case, it slows its decrease. And we might think, okay, what is, is, is it possible to do something to, uh, what, what happens? So m some countries might think, okay, let's call out the agreement and see what happens. So here there is a uh, comparison of what happens in the business, uh, in the decarbonization. This is compared to the business as usual, decarbonization decarbonization with countries calling off. So we are talking about visa grab countries. And in this case, we have, what we do is we put tariffs to these countries to avoid, uh, to, to sort of uh, retaliate some, some sort of, to, uh, we are uh, not purchasing production from these countries, from, from the visa grab countries. And, and this could be like a countermeasure. What is shown is that it doesn't really work. Because if we do this, uh, if we remove these uh, um, tariffs on, on imports from the visitor, visitor countries that we assume they're calling off the agreements, uh, we are 
in a way, not using any more fossil fuels, or the rest of Europe, Drupal 27, is not using any more fossil fuels, but they can be produced, which means that if we take away those, uh, if we take away those tariffs, uh, they will be selling, the rest of Europe will be selling, even so slightly, uh, fossil fuels to this company, to this, uh, sorry, to these um, uh, countries, and they will be producing at a lower price and selling it back. Therefore, the the GDP will decrease for everyone because we have more exports to those countries. So there is a slight decrease in, uh, in, in a, a slightly lower decrease in GDP. And actually for the Visegrad countries, there is an increase. Yeah, so just the emission in these two cases, we have my, way more emissions in, uh, of course, in, in cooperation case than in the non-cooperation case. Yeah. So I went directly to the conclusions. I know, but that's uh, that's fine. Also, uh, no questions so far <laughs> in the in the chat. So I, I think we'll go straight to the second presentation, so that we have uh, enough time for the debate uh, in the end. Good. Um, the second presentation is by uh, Dr. Panagiotis uh, Frank Kos. Uh, please. Uh, uh, you can share your presentation. Uh. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Peter, uh, for the introduction. Thanks uh, for inviting us to, to present here. Um, let me share. Can you see it? Yes, mm -hmm. I can see it. So, thanks. We can start. Uh, so, I'm going to present about the, some new uh, insights from the InnoPaths and Navigate projects, which are uh, mo large modeling projects funded from Horizon 2020, uh, focusing on the socioeconomic, industrial, and institutional impacts of uh, decarbonization policies in the EU. So this work has been jointly done by Jamie 3 a team, which are uh, listed here. Um, so uh, starting uh, first, uh, yeah, brief outline, I'm going to present first uh, the model that we use, which is the Jamie 3 fit model, one of the most um, widely used CGE models in the, in the EU. Um, I'm going to present some new methodological developments that uh, we recently did in order to improve uh, the transition to carbon neutrality. And then I'm going to present some uh, recent applications uh, towards assessing the macroeconomic impact uh, of the EU Green Deal. Uh, starting off, uh, the Jamie 3 uh, model, probably you have heard of, but it's a global uh, CGE model, computable general equilibrium model, uh, that provides details on the interactions between the economy, the energy system, and the, the environment. Uh, it is actually based uh, on multi-regional, multi-sectoral modeling, so it, ha it captures around 50 regions and 50 um, commodities, I mean 50 uh, production sectors. Uh, as the model pr previously introduced, we use the nested production function, uh, including um, capital, labor, energy, and materials, and of course, technical progress. Um, a distinctive feature of the model is the equilibrium and employment for labor market, because actually, uh, commonly, let's say, traditionally, the uh, CG models uh, mo uh, model the perfect uh, labor market where you do not have any uh, unemployment. But of course, this is not uh, a constant picture of the reality. So uh, we uh, modified it by assuming equilibrium unemployment. Um, we have the households where uh, they have uh, uh, they provide labor, of course, to the market, but uh, also consume the goods. Uh, and we I distinguish between durable goods and non-durable goods. For instance, durable goods they considered as private cars, where non-durable goods linked to durable, for instance, are oil products that uh, households use to fuel their cars. Uh, trade uh, is endogenous in the model, so we have detailed bilateral trade among all uh, regions in the model and all sectors uh, formulated based on the on the Arlington assumption, by where we are implicitly assume that um, all goods are imperfect substitutes. Of course, the model GEMI3 has been widely used to simulate the impacts of various policy instruments. And in the last years, the main focus is on the energy and climate policy uh, issues. Um, here's a brief structure of the model where you, you see the core elements of it and the basic modules, which are all interlinked together 
in order to form um, the, the so-called general equilibrium. So we have uh, three different uh, equilibriums in the three core markets, the capital market equilibrium, the labor market equilibrium, and the product market equilibrium. So all these actually define the general equilibrium in the entire economy. And then, of course, through uh, endogenous bilateral trade uh, modeling, we also uh, uh, project the equilibrium at the global scale. So uh, we, the, there are a lot of factors that are actually going to influence what are the GDP impacts uh, of decarbonization by, by country. And of course, this relates to the decarbonization measure that is used, for instance, if it's carbon pricing or some other instruments. Um, the labor intensity of the clean energy technologies relative to fossil fuels that are substituted. What is the re revenue recycling scheme for carbon revenues that uh, uh, is used? Um, the core financing assumptions, because this is actually quite critical, because um, uh, it is the, the, the models tend to show very, very different results depending on whether uh, there is loan-based finance versus self-finance because, um, yeah, this can lead to, grow, to the so-called crowding out effects, which are prevalent in CG models, uh, actually showing very uh, large um, negative impacts from decarbonization. Uh, also, other factors like the availability of required skills and the trade position of a country, especially in terms of whether it's a net fossil fuel importer or exporter, also play a very important role. So. Uh, the additional value of multi-sectoral CG is that they, they provide, let's say, a robust framework in order to represent all the above factors in a, in a, um, in a type of framework and capturing all their complex uh, interactions. So this is why they are so uh, much used in applied policy making. Uh, recently, of course, you all know that uh, there is a, this proposal by the Commission for the transformation to uh, climate neutrality by mid-century as part of the European Green Deal. Um, of course, this will require transformative changes across the European economy because all sectors uh, have to be transformed, have to be restructured from a fossil fuel paradigm to a paradigm of uh, increased renewable energy, uh, energy efficiency, electrification, and also hydrogen uh, uptake. So this the entire economy has to has to change and of course this posed some very important considerations for conventional cg models because this type of models cannot represent uh, deep structural transformation because uh, they are very much based on ces function constant elasticity of substitution functions which are quite rigid in how they represent uh, technology uptake how they present this new uh, clean vectors, clean fuels, clean energy vectors, etc. So we had to, to implement several modeling improvements in order to, to accurately uh, show how the economy, the European economy can be transformed towards a low emission paradigm. Um, first, we introduced uh, technology progress, actually endogenizing how uh, the model projects uh, technology progress for clean energy technologies. And this depends on learning by doing and adding the expenditure and going to uh, say a few words a bit later in the presentation. We also uh, introduced detailed sub-modules uh, for the energy system technologies, actually trying to, to improve how the model represents uh, different power generation technologies, different types of car, for instance, electric vehicles or fuel cell vehicles, different types of boilers in households, etc. So we move beyond, let's say, conventional CES formulation, try to, with with the power of uh, detailed sub-modules that, that can capture quite easily the specificities of its subsystem uh, in order to, uh, to implement the new deep decarbonization scenarios. And this, of course, we have also the option to, to make the detail linking with energy system models like, uh, like discussed before. And for this, we use primes for European countries and Prometheus for uh, non-EU countries. Uh, we also introduced an explicit representation of the financial sector uh, and recently, we have developed a satellite module with, uh, which can identify multiple households uh, in order to be able to uh, account for distributional impacts of climate policies, which are one of the most important policy concerns towards uh, decarbonization. And also, we have introduced 
uh, the sectors that are manufactured, the low carbon technologies, are separate industrial sectors. So moving back, moving on to, to the issue of learning, which is quite important. So what, why we have to include uh, endogenous technology progress in the, as part of the macroeconomic assessment. Uh, so conventionally, uh, before this endogenous growth thing, um, decarbonization had some effects on the economy. These were triggered firstly by substitution of imported fuels, uh, which are, in, at least in most European countries, we import fossil fuels, by products and services which are uh, related, of course, to low carbon technologies, which are domestically produced. However, this, pro, uh, this progress is tend to be costly in the short term, so it poses some additional cost to the households and the firms. And this uh, in price increases can lead to the so-called so crowding out effects in industries, uh, which reduces the, their competitiveness and, of course, has detrimental effects uh, in GDP. So it leads to reduced GDP and competitiveness loss, as uh, shown here. However, by introducing this endogenous learning, we, we can also show different effects because uh, the, the representation of how uh, innovation can change um, the decarbonization process is quite critical in this. Because, uh, for instance, uh, the low carbon transition, of course, uh, can provide opportunities for R&D, commercial uptake of clean energy technologies, which, especially in case that there is the, these are financially supported. Um, this, of course, the, this learning can moderate uh, the cost increase, especially in the longer term. So, if the EU domestically manages to domestically produce some of these uh, low carbon technologies, for instance, wind turbines that is currently where it comes as a major uh, player uh, globally, it can also um, gain some competitive advantage. So, by putting this in the overall picture that I've presented before. We saw, of course, that the, the impacts of decarbonization GDP are not so high that, than we previously thought it would be. So uh, the impacts can be small, for instance, or it can even, we can even have uh, GDP gains in the longer term. So the net effect, of course, captures on how all these factors um, are interlinked with each other. So moving on to some uh, applications of this framework, very recent ones. First of all, we use this improved uh, GEMI-3 model to, to assess what are the employment impacts uh, of decarbonization for, Europe, for the EU. So here we see uh, the changes uh, in European jobs relative to a reference scenario. And of course, we, we, we see that the effects uh, on, the aggregate level, uh, on the aggregate level are relatively small because uh, the increase is not higher than 1%, for instance, of um, of total employment, but uh, there are some large sectoral shifts which are induced by decarbonization. So in this way, decarbonization will have clear winners and clear losers in terms of sectors. Uh, on the one side, on the, on the positive side, uh, we see that uh, domestic activity and jobs uh, are going to increase in the construction sector, in the electricity sector, be actually because of increased uh, electrification, which is a crucial part of the decarbonization process while additional jobs will also be created in clean energy manufacturing and also in the agriculture sector because uh, advanced biofuels can be produced also domestically so giving a boost to this sector as well of course the, the picture is quite different in um, in the sectors that are gonna lose uh, from this process especially the fossil fuel supply sector. So all elements of the fossil fuel supply from coal mining to oil extraction, oil refining. So all aspects of the fossil fuel supply sector is gonna lose. And also we see some reductions also uh, in heavy uh, industrial manufacturing. Um, so uh, uh, moving on to, to the specific, to, to take a closer examination of the uh, industrial impact. So what are the impacts of, for specific industries? And we see that especially uh, in the left figure, we see especially that if the EU acts alone on decarbonization, so if it implements all this ambitious uh, carbon neutrality transition, when the others, when non-EU regions uh, do not uh, move towards this direction, 
we see that there is an increasing risk of carbon leakage. So we have a relocation of energy intensive and trade exposed industries to, to non-EU countries. Especially this, the, the, the sectors that are, uh, face higher risks are the ones of metals, of non-metallic minerals and chemical products, which are, let's say, the, mo the sectors that are most vulnerable to the transition. And also these sectors uh, are now protected by, with anti-leakage measures by, by the Commission as well. And the, these plans, are, uh, of course, uh, will continue in the future, especially because of this, because these sectors face the highest challenges. Uh, then we examine uh, what will be the impact of, uh, of inserting a border carbon adjustment measure. This, on the one hand, has proven very effective in reducing the risk of relocation, as shown in the figure below, so it can protect domestic manufacturing activities, but on the other hand, can be negative for GDP. Uh, however, when we use all these revenues, that uh, actually uh, the ETS revenues and BCA revenues, in order to finance low carbon under D and social security contributions, this can be beneficial for the European economy and especially for, um, for the labor market. Um, another very recent application is the distribution, the modeling of the distributional impact, GEMI-3. I will not go into detail, technical details here, but what we do is actually a soft link of the CG model, which has one household per, per country with a bottom-up model, which separates 10 income deciles. So differentiating their income by source, their consumption and saving patterns. And um, this, uh, this modeling framework enabled us to, to explore what will be the social impacts because uh, the impacts of decarbonization will not be felt the same by different um, income classes, but uh, literature suggests that there are gonna be regressive impacts uh, to, for those classes that are for the low income households. And we see here that uh, this is true. So we see some negative uh, impacts, uh, which is mostly triggered by because decarbonization uh, has lower, will reduce the demand for lower skilled workforce because um, jobs uh, like uh, the ones that require lower skill will, will decrease. So this can have some detrimental impacts on the social side. However, and this is the right graph shows it that uh, when we recycling, when we recycle ETS revenues as transfers to these households, as direct transfers, this of course can be a lot beneficial and increase the incomes for the poorest households. So the message from this is that ETS revenues can be used for different purposes and can be very, very important in order to alleviate the negative socioeconomic impacts of the transition. And the last, um, uh, the, one of the last uh, applications of the model is to explore the impacts of COVID and green recovery packages. So uh, here we, in a very simple um, scenario setup, I mean, using basically uh, the IA assumptions from the green recovery, uh, also that they prepared last year, we see that when uh, we implement these green recovery measures, we can, the EU can further reduce CO2 emissions, so towards closing the gap, with a new 55 GHG reduction target by 2030, while in parallel boosting GDP growth and creating new jobs. And these new jobs will be created especially in the construction sector, which is required especially for uh, as part of the, um, uh, of the building renovation package and uh, all these uh, activities related to improving insulation in buildings, which, which is a sector that was also hit hard by COVID. So it is quite important to, to see that there is a clear possibility here to, to get back the jobs in the sector that was hit, it was badly hit by, uh, by COVID. And of course, all this, given that uh, there is availability of low-cost low loans for the agents, which are paid back a later uh, into the future. And with this, yes. I go to the yeah, final fine. slide. We need to be closing now, yeah. <laughs> yeah Excellent. Final slide. Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, including some uh, brief <clears throat> conclusions from uh, from the study. So we have shown that the transition to, to climate neutrality will have limited impacts on aggregate GDP employment in the EU, but because it is essentially, it, 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 because this will be based actually on transferring on uh, transferring resources from one sector, from carbon intensive sectors to sectors that are not carbon intensive, but without, let's say, major impacts on the aggregate level. 
But of course, we'll have large sectoral shifts as explained before with the construction sector actually being one of the most important ones, especially related to building renovations. Um, we saw that there are methodological advancements required in order to improve how CGE models and other macroeconomic models capture the, the assessment, the, uh, capture the impacts of um, deep decarbonization. And in this context, uh, low cost finance and enhanced low carbon innovation can reduce the energy cost increases. And also what is very, very important is the way to reduce to, to recycling uh, the carbon revenues to the economy, because this can be used very effectively in order to, to create more jobs or to alleviate the negative uh, social, social effects of decarbonization. So thank you. That's it from my side, of course, open to, to any questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as um, as we did it in the first panel, uh, we go also as we did not do it in the first panel. We had a short break in between. We go straight to the panel discussion now, and um, and uh, for the panel discussion, we uh, say welcome to Hector uh, Polit, director of.